I can honestly say that I have worked as hard and, and in some ways harder than I did in my corporate world and when I was freelance PR before the corporate world. That it's not as glamorous as it looks thing, that's part of it. Are you ready? All right. Hi there. Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show. I'm your host, Nora Dunn, AKA the Professional Hobo. And in this series, I speak with a wide variety of people who have travel lifestyles and remote careers to get the real dirt on what it's like to travel long-term and work remotely. My guest today is Susan Portnoy. Once a high-powered communications and PR professional in Manhattan, Susan Portnoy left her successful career in 2018 to focus on her website, which is called The Insatiable Traveler, as well as freelance travel photography, writing, and content creation. As a freelancer, her work has appeared in Newsweek, Travel Weekly, Adventure.com, Afar, Wendy Perrin, Washington Post, National Geographic, and U.S. News & World Report, among other publications. This year, she was named Photographer of the Year by the prestigious SATW, which stands for Society of American Travel Writers, Bill Muster Awards, and she's won multiple Lowell Thomas Awards, those are like the Oscars of travel, for her photo depictions of travel. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Oh, I'm so excited, Nora. Thank you. This is excellent. We've known each other. I mean, you and I are both industry veterans. I, I know we've been in similar circles for many, many years. One of the things I love about this series is I actually get to meet people that I've known online for so many years in person. So it's a real pleasure to meet you. We've hung out in a couple of clubhouse rooms, but yep. now I get to lay eyes on you. So, you know, it's real now. We're friends forever. <laughs> We're there. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're just like this. <laughs> now, I would love, I'd love to talk to you. I, I'd love to start at the beginning. I know that your freelance career has changed many times over the last 10 years. Uh, so perhaps we can start at the beginning. Tell me what you were doing at Condé Nast. Uh, at Condé Nast, I was the VP of corporate communications. So in the traditional sense, I handled any time that um, executives need to be interviewed, if there were stories that we wanted to get out there that um, spoke to the whole company. And then I also handled the PR for uh, consumer events um, that were branded entertainment. Some, uh, one, for example, was um, called Fashion Rocks, and that was a $70 million uh, branded content program and had a magazine, and it was a CBS TV show and a concert. And so it was, it was great because I had um, a lot of different things that I could do. Wow. And how did you get into that to begin with? Uh, PR exactly or or mm -hmm. that particular company? Uh, well, maybe both, unless it's, if there's a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, so I started off um, in the design world, in the fashion world. Um, and I, my first PR job was with Nicole Miller. And actually, I was a salesperson there. And it was a very small company at the time. And her partner um, was very frugal. And he didn't want an outside PR team. And Nicole liked me. We had a couple different things that we did together in terms of um, events and things like that. And one day they told me, I am no longer a salesperson. I'm a PR person. And that was it. Like, I had no choice. <laughs> Um, unless I wanted to quit, of course. So I basically learned from, you know, the ground up and it was scary. Um, but I also think, um, it gave me a lot of self-confidence. You know, it's so interesting because I, I think it's really not all that uncommon to stumble into careers or to organically find your way through uh, different careers. Uh, and, you know, you think you could just pick a career and go to school for it, but that doesn't seem to be how uh, things go. And your career really just continued to evolve, though, from, from working as an employee with Condé Nast to then, I believe you, you moved to freelance at some point about 10 years ago. What happened? Well, actually, I had, I'd been freelance prior to Condé Nast, and I was working with companies like Hearst and Condé Nast and, and the Kennedy Center, and I was doing that. And I'd been asked to take a role there um, at Condé Nast, and it was a great job, and I couldn't say no. Uh, however, when the economy took a dive, um, I lasted four years, but finally it 
you know, it got pared down and my team went, you know, out the door along with me. And um, so I was going to go back to freelance, which I was very comfortable with. I, I understood how it works. Um, I think the only thing that was different that I wish I could have is um, that community, um, having somebody that you can go to their desk and, and ask a question and those sort of um, spontaneous ideas come about. So I do miss that. You know, you, you point out two different great things. One of which, of course, is that workplace culture and, and what's missing when you don't have that. Yeah. And I have to say, I've been a freelancer uh, in one capacity or another for a few decades now. And that's probably the thing that I miss the most. You know, I don't miss a lot from the nine to five uh, grind, as it were. Right. But one of the things that I do miss was that workplace culture and being able to, to you know, you have a group of people that you work with daily and that you can share ideas with and, and whatnot. Uh, and that does seem to be a little bit lacking in the freelance world. I'm curious, do you have any coping mechanisms for that? Yeah, actually. And it, it really kind of depends um, on where I am at the moment. So it could be um, going for a walk. So obviously I'm not going to have that same kind of communication, but I feel like I'm part of the world and that's an important thing. Um, and recently I have been doing a lot of Zoom co-working, which has, has helped me with that because other friends, other professionals, we're all there, we talk to each other, we can ask each other questions. Uh, we happen to be in uh, mostly different uh, genres of work, but it still gives me that moment of, of feeling like I've got people around me. That's fascinating. I have not jumped on the Zoom co-working bandwagon. Uh, I actually thought it was a little bit silly. I'm like, why am I going to sit on a computer with my video camera looking at me? But I, I really hear what you say in being, first of all, it's a way to hold each other accountable to actually the work sessions that you do, but also that that uh, opportunity to share in between. Uh, I mean, do you do, what do you do? You work on like 25 minute increments and then um, you chat for a while? 25, 30 minutes, it depends. I do it with a couple different people. Um, or different groups, I should say. And it kind of depends. If we feel like we're in, you know, in on a roll, we'll stay for 30 minutes. But it is that accountability because for whatever reason, I can't trick myself into thinking I'm co-working and be focused. And it really does help it help to focus me. I, you know, it's kind of ridiculous, but that's the way it is. And so we do the 25, 30 minutes. We all say hello. How did we did we get um, did we accomplish what we had hoped to accomplish? Uh, where are we with that? And it's, it's great. I thought it was sort of dopey too. I did. Um, <laughs> no doubt. And a friend of mine, oh, who you know, Sherry Ott. Uh, That's of course. She's been on the show too. Um, yep. Ott's, from Ott's World. Um, and she suggested it. So I tried it and I was kind of blown away about how much better um, I felt about doing my work and how much more focused I was. So I am all about co-working now, no matter how silly it seems. In a post-pandemic world, do you think that this means you would also start going to co-working spaces? Was that something that you did before the pandemic or something that you might be inspired to do going forward? No, I think it's it, it really is that communication with someone else and and with Sherry or people that I've come to know it's it's that it's that kind of connection it's not just being in the room with them i get that by going on a walk um i feel like part of the world but if i'm going to a workspace without the conveniences of you know all, all the things that i have at home um it just doesn't it doesn't affect me the same way and so that was never my thing you know, it's funny you should mention that. I've I've struggled with co-working spaces myself, partly because I, I am disciplined to a fault. So, I mean, I, I don't really need someone to hold me accountable or I didn't need to be in a physical office space to feel like that's my chance to be productive. Uh, having said that, I also recognize that that is an opportunity for the sort of things that you're talking about with your Zoom sessions, which is networking and, and chatting with people, sharing of ideas. And ultimately as well, we're very lone, freelancers in general, and, and especially people who 
who work remotely, we are lone wolves. I mean, we are we <laughs> yep. are really in it on our own. And any opportunity we have where we can actually share uh, our, our ideas and our processes uh, and your, your Zoom um, co-working sessions sound like part mastermind as well as part uh, I think that's a great way to say it. Yeah, I think that what the group tends to be is part mastermind, part social, uh, part problem solving. I mean, all that has come to play. I have learned about, you know, things as light as the next Netflix show I should watch <laughs> to, yeah. you know, things that have actually made a difference in the way I work or you know, associating with different people has made that networking connection. So I, I really like it. I, I do. Wow. Very good. Uh, now, I, I think we got a little ahead, or at least I got a little ahead of myself. I would love to continue with your career progression because you were working for Condé Nast. Uh, you were freelancing then for them. And they shuttered up. And uh, at some stage of the game, I, I know you took your freelance career in a bit of a, di a different direction. Was that what happened in 2018? That is. Um, but I just to, to correct, um, I, I didn't do freelance for Condé Nast after I left the company when I was laid off. Uh, at that time, I worked with companies like Adobe and ShopStyle and did a lot of you know different writing for uh, small campaigns and things like that. And at that time, um, that's when the photography and writing about my travel started to you know, come into play. Um, in 2018, I was at a point that I was loving travel and photography and not PR that much. And it had always been sort of my work lifeline. I loved it. I loved doing it. And all of a sudden I didn't. And I part of that is, is that I still worked within the media sector of PR and I, you know, it's kind of journalism and all those kinds of things are falling apart. Adobe was great, but big projects come to an end. And I found myself in 2018 sort of at my last, with my last client and realizing that I hadn't gone out, pitched and tried to get more work because I just didn't want it. I mean, obviously I want to pay the bills, but I didn't want to do it. And it was harder for me to do that. So um, I wrestled with that for a long time. I went to interviews on the PR front thinking, you know, pragmatically that I should be doing that because um, that's where I've created a reputation and everything. And um, it literally made me ill. It did. I, I was getting depressed. I, I was exhausted. I was, you know, it just it really manifested into physical ailments. And later in the year, um, I decided to take the leap. And I said, okay, uh, I'm not gonna go and try to get another PR client because it's obvious I don't wanna do it in every sense of the, you know, of the way. So um, I let it go. So at the end of 2018, I, I decided that I was going to let go of the PR and work towards really establishing myself as a full-time blogger, content creator, photographer, and focus my attention on that because that was just more interesting to me. There, you know, there's there's great opportunities here, and there's also I want to acknowledge the part of your journey where you uh, first of all, <laughs> there's a hustle involved with freelance work. It tends to be a feast or famine sort of deal, but the reality is no freelance gig will last forever. And at some stage of the game, we all have to hustle for the next one. And uh, I did a, an interview with Life Pedersen, who was a freelance travel writer, and he found that freelance that never ending requirement to hustle very difficult. And he also found when his when his gigs petered out, he just did not have the inspiration to go out and get more. And he recognized that as an opportunity to change what he was doing, as you did as well, right? You felt, oh God, I just don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And I have to say, I also had the same thing happen. I was doing a lot of freelance writing uh, while in the first 10 or so years of building my own website. Uh, and it was definitely a complimentary form of income. But at some stage of the game, I thought, 
yeah, now I think that this is actually taking me away from being able to do other projects that I would really enjoy doing. So what an interesting shift for you to be able to move into something that was, uh, that would, you know, make you a little more inspired to get up every day. That absolutely. It was terrifying because up to that point, <laughs> any work that I had done um, was secondary to the clients and the PR. So I could go six months if I was wor working on a launch and not touch it, not take a photo, not write anything. So I, I didn't have the full-time experience. And as you know, I mean all the things you have to learn. Uh, there were so many things I learned the hard way. Um, SEO and, you know, the best conferences to go to, all of that was incremental. It, it, it took time. And I'm still learning. I'm still finding out stuff. Well, blogging in particular and content creation in general uh, is an ever-evolving industry. I, every time I think I know everything there is to know, I find something out that makes me realize I know way less than I ever thought I did. <laughs> and there's always a new learning curve, right? There's always a new SEO practice or something that needs to be changed, and changed or adapted. So it's definitely an ever-evolving sort of career. But you also have a lot of different balls in the air. You've got a, a variety, you've got the photography, you've got your website, you've got freelance writing. How do you manage these multiple facets of, of your career? I have to say that it wasn't as easy as I would have liked, mainly because I'm great on a deadline. So when you're starting a career, it's not like you have, you know, all these things lined up. Ideally, I probably should have, but I didn't. And the deadlines make me focus. I'm good under pressure. I'm good on those deadlines. The co-working and, and the need for that really comes from me having a little too much time on my hands, I guess you could say. And, you know, there's always something that you can do with a website. There's, you know, I could go out and photograph every single day, but the realities are different. And um, I, I, I just think that for me, that extra pressure is actually beneficial. I, I cannot agree more with you uh, than that. I tend to be very self-driven. I, I don't necessarily need a deadline, but I generally find when I have a deadline or when I create a self-imposed deadline, I, I will be infinitely more productive. And you, <laughs> there's also, I don't forgot, I think it's called the Parkinson's principle, uh, where your uh, work will expand to fill whatever space of time you give it. So you might only have three hours of work to do, but if you give yourself eight hours to do it, it's going to take you eight hours. And I, I want, that happens to me all the time. I mean, in, in the pandemic in particular, when I was isolated and locked down, yeah, right? Me I mean, I wow. work day after day and I was like, wow, what do I have to show for this? Why am I working so hard and nothing's happening? It's so true. It's so true. And you know, I am focused when I have this mission and I am focused in that I wanted to do this as a whole. Um, get me on any one day, though, I would fall into the same trap. It's I have one thing to write or I have a bio to create or whatever it is. And I find, you know, more than that time is needed because I'm unfocused and I'm looking at Facebook and you know, doing things that aren't really work. <laughs> so what, uh, co-working obviously has been a great way to manage that, to reel yourself in. What other tools do you employ in order to uh, be productive and manage multiple things? Well, it's interesting because COVID helped in one regard for me in that I was comfortable you know, prior to COVID, I was comfortable just sort of hanging out in my apartment. I'd be traveling and then I'd come and I'd be some, somewhat of an introvert. And then all of a sudden, introvert was, you know, uh, being an introvert was forced upon me. And um, so I've really, I hate, it sounds so cliche, but I really do try to walk as many times a week as I can to have some outside moment. Uh, listening to a podcast, giving myself the permission to take a break and realize it's in my best interest. Otherwise, I'm just going to do that spinning thing where I'm not really focused. 
Um, from a practical point of view in freelance, and this is a big one, um, people who are, who are starting in freelance and some who don't, uh, forget about taxes. <laughs> so that's, for me, I've always been really good with money. And, you know, I immediately, as soon as I get a check or it's in my account, I am pushing a certain amount of it into a savings account that is the tax savings account so that I don't have to worry when, you know, my accountant and I meet that I don't have that money because you forget and you think, oh, well, I certainly have enough to pay for that. Mm, taxes. Just always take money out for taxes no matter what you're doing. That is brilliant advice because I think that especially for freelancers and those who are newly self-employed, that is something that we all forget about. And then suddenly tax time comes and suddenly you owe a whole pile of money. And uh, yeah, there's it's always important to make sure that you take that. Now, I think that also applies as well to investments. If you're saving for retirement, take that off the top. General financial planning uh conventions dictate that you take the money off the top for all the all the things that you might find you know you're going to so take the money off for retirement take the money off for taxes and any other investment goals that you have because the reality is you will likely find a way to spend the rest of the money but you'll also find a way to make do with the rest of the money exactly and always pay off your credit card every month uh, that's 100%. super important uh, because I have had friends that have gone into that black hole of just owing more and more for longer periods of time on a credit card. And it feels easy at first and you literally can keep going if you don't pay it off. So that's a huge thing. And let's face it, I had a long, long career in a more, you know, conventional career. And I am a good saver. And I think that's a big thing for people who want to start blogging or what have you. You need to have some money on the side because I would be living here in New York City. I would really be screwed if I didn't <laughs> have some savings during COVID. I mean, I didn't work for months and months and months. And I'm still having to think about uh, you know, supplementing the work that I'm now starting to get, it's slowly starting to, you know, move forward. But, you know, I, I honestly don't know what I would do um, if, if that, if I didn't have that. And it's so important. So I, I really recommend that your listeners put some money away before they get themselves into a bad place. That is excellent advice. And I always suggest that people get their financial house in order before they make a big change, be it a career change, working to moving to a freelance career or to self-employment, and also to in advance of embarking on any kind of travel lifestyle. It really is important to get your financial house in order. And your advice is on point, mm -hmm. which takes me back to uh, you making this leap, making this leap of faith into uh, working 100% for yourself. You mentioned earlier that it was a terrifying move. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you were also in your 40s when you did that. And I'm curious how that felt and how you walked yourself through that process. That was really scary. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Um, as I mentioned, I was feeling physically, you know, ill. I, I, I just didn't have the energy anymore. And it was, it was exactly like a textbook, um, subconscious telling you what you really want to do. And I was getting very depressed. Um, and that was then snowballing. And I really got to a dark place. Uh, and that was because I, I kept saying to myself, but this is the career that I know I can make money in, but I don't love it anymore. I don't even like it anymore. And this is the thing that makes me happy, even though there's a lot of unknowns. And I went through that part where I was talking to myself. I'm like, would I have to sell my apartment? Like, what could ha what are the worst things that can happen that people throw at themselves in these moments? And finally, it, it really did just come down to I had to make a decision. I wasn't, I you know, it wasn't permanent if I didn't want it to be. I could go back to PR when I, you know, if I need to, um, though I don't want to. Um, and <laughs> and um, so I just did it. And the 
sky didn't fall. Frank, you know what I mean? The sky didn't fall. I, once I had made that decision, I felt okay. It's kind of that thing, you know, when you buy a new car or, you know, a house or it's something that you've, you're investing a lot of your, your life and your, you know, finances into your, you know, you struggle to sign that piece of paper and you're like, I'm going to eat pizza for the rest of my life. And then, you know, two months later you get over it <laughs> and you're back to having a cocktail. So um, it, I just, I took a long time longer than um, I would have liked looking back, um, but it was what it was. Well, and you also mentioned that you, you know, if you needed to, you had the option of going back into PR. So you obviously did not burn any bridges. You knew that, right. that you had that backup plan and that fallback. And I also think that that's very important. That's a, something that helps us take that step forward in knowing that, that it's not the only way we can go. You know, right. that you have actually left your options open. And I think that that's also an important transitional tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, now it, I certainly could go PR, the, the fundamentals of PR still exist, but the landscape has changed considerably. So I know that if I needed to go back there, it would be an uphill climb. Um, until I got settled. And because I'm a type A personality, I probably wouldn't feel settled for, you know, five years. <laughs> so um, that is something that I think about. It's like, all right, you do have the, this talent for something um, that you're no longer doing, but it has changed. And so it does give me even more motivation for what I'm doing now. Now, Manhattan ain't a cheap place to live. And you're, you're still there. Do you still living in Manhattan now? I am. Uh, yes. So, I, so obviously the cost of living there or the cost of even really just, uh, just you know, having a, a place to your cost of accommodation obviously would be a, a financial driver. Like you've got to be able to make a certain money in order to make that a go. Were there any other uh, lifestyle decisions that you made in order to make space for or accommodate your freelance career? Well, interestingly enough, I wasn't going to spend a lot of money and I had the luxury to spend some serious money on traveling. All of a sudden I thought, I, I can't spend that kind of money on one trip. I need to be thought more thoughtful about it. And also trips, um, as I got better, um, and more known, um, then I started being offered trips and things like that. But then you are working 24 seven when you do that. So that was a significant style change is realizing that I'm that I needed to have my own travel where nothing was expected of me. Um, and I've worked that into my life as much as one can do in COVID. Because the thing is, is that 2018 is not that long ago. 2019. So I, I decided to do this, um, you know, in like October of 2018. So jumped into 2019, um, needed to, you know, hit the, you know, get the going, getting going by summer. I had trips planned all the way through the end of the year. So it's not like I've had a ton of time to, you know, take this place by storm, this, this career by storm because 2020, pulled the rug out. Um, so I'm lucky I have an apartment um, that I own. Uh, I also kind of always lived beneath my means. Um, my, that's how I was brought up. So um, when I was in fashion, I looked great because I was getting free clothes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but it, when I left, it's not like I tried to keep that up. So those kinds of things, the you know, I'd had so much of it, the parties and the celebrities and all those kinds of things. I can fully say I was in it. Um, and now th simpler things make me happy. Um, and I don't, I think that's a big thing is that you've got to recognize that fundamentally your mindset will change whether you want it to or not. And, and you're going to have to 
organize your thoughts about how to go forward in a lot of different ways and and give up things, no doubt. I mean, New York, I'm considering moving, absolutely am. I just wanna make sure it's a, a smart move um, for the market. Do you have any advice for people who are aspiring remote freelancers? Well, I think, um, just to reiterate, because I think it's really important, the tax things, putting money away for taxes. Um, I wish that I had invested more in the legs of my business. Um, I was very, um, I kept hedging my bets. So I was first on Tumblr, and then I kind of put the insatiable traveler on Tumblr to see what that was. And then I did a WordPress hosted site and then learned that it's much better to be self-hosted. So I would have preferred that I had just taken the money and done things like that and also go to more conferences and networking um, that I didn't do right up at the front. And I think I, I would be farther along if I did. So I, I, I think you have to, even though it's the scary thing because you just gave up your paychecks, um, you have to put some aside to to be your your foundation for the, the career that you've decided on. And that's an excellent point because I think a lot of people, uh, and oh, all right, let me speak for myself. When I got into <laughs> freelancing, I thought it was free. Right? I, I, I thought that, okay, the, all I have to offer as a freelancer is sweat equity. All I need is a computer and an internet connection to freelance remotely. And what else should I need? And I did not consider things like going to conferences and networking. I did not consider uh, having the proper equipment or maybe programs that might help me uh, do anything from find gigs to manage my tasks and you know send invoices and beyond. I bootlegged it all the way. And here I am 15 years later. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I did okay, but I, I think that was a time and place thing. You know, I was in the right time in the right place to, to be, uh, to be able to take advantage of, of being on the leading edge of a wave. Uh, the reality is that was my saving grace. And only now 15 years into, I really understand the necessity to invest in yeah. your career, even if you think it's free. Like, even if you think as a freelancer that what you're doing is free, it, all the it ain't free. No. <laughs> it's not free. It ain't free. It ain't free. And any business requires an investment. So I really applaud you for uh, twice encouraging our, our listeners and our viewers to make that investment in yourselves uh, and in your businesses. That's very important. Yes, very important. Um, another tip, if I may, is sure. uh, try to set up as many templates as possible. So I have a yeah. template for my invoices and I have a digital version of my letterhead and I have things that are already there so that I can, you know, not waste time on that stuff. And so as many ways that you can create templates, create a certain system um, and stick to it, that'll help and take a lot of um, sort of that nitty gritty stuff that we all have to do, but can be overwhelming sometimes. And that's a great time management task as well. Taking anything that that ends up being repetitive in any way, there is a template that you can create or there is a shortcut that you can you can find in order to maximize your, your time and your time management. Absolutely. Well, Brilliant. Susan, I uh, thank you so much for these amazing tips. Where can we find you? You can find me at the Insatiable Traveler online, um, obviously, and also Insatiable Traveler on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and also you might find uh, some of my work in, in regular publications, as you'd mentioned before. And um, also, uh, I have a purely photographic site under Susan Portnoy Photography. So there's a lot of different ways that you can ac access different realms of my work. And I have seen your photography, and I can attest firsthand that you uh, are well-deserving of you. the awards that you've gotten. And I'm so glad that you're now adding uh, creative narrative to the photos that you take. I think that that is, a, a mac bleh, I think that that is the, the perfect match. Uh, and I wish you all the luck in your Thank freelancing you. career going forward. Thank you, Nora. This has been fun. I really appreciate you having me on. It's a distinct pleasure, and it's my pleasure. 
I'm Nora Dunn, aka The Professional Hobo, and I will catch you next time.